Hello and welcome to another episode of Something Rotten. This is our second episode on The Last of Us Part 2. In this episode, we are going to be covering from, uh, I guess, day two and three of Seattle, uh, at least of Ellie's section of that. My name is Jacob Geller. I am joined, as always, by Blake Hester. Uh, Blake, you have been eating this game up. Yeah, I, yeah, I pre-played, but more importantly, something I'd like to bring up, Jacob. Uh, two things I'd like to bring up, actually. One, you don't follow me on Blue Sky. <laughs> I didn't I didn't know. I thought you were done with social medias. I didn't know you had a Blue Sky. You, you didn't follow me on... Yeah, I, you don't you didn't follow me i see you blue skying it up out there tweeting about things whatever they call them uh second you've never had that ten, tenor or cadence with your intro of the show it was a completely different delivery you wow. did this time as someone who listens and edits every podcast that was the first one that sounded different except for the first bonus when you let a big uh out in the middle and i didn't cut it out and i regretted that because it sounded kind of bad <laughs> But that was a weird that was a weird delivery. So other other than that I had that cadence to start with. But maybe I'm feeling particularly professional today. Is that fair? Yeah, you think so? I think so because we have uh among other look, this is gonna be insulting to all our other guests who I haven't apparently had this tenor of introduction for. But today <laughs> we have a guest who I'm very excited about um joining us the uh, a, a narrative designer on Thirsty Suitors, a host of the podcast Origin Story, um, and notably for us, a writer for Unwinnable. We are joined today by Philip Russell. Hello, welcome. Hey, thanks for having me, guys. Absolutely. It's great to be joined by another Unwinnable alumni. I feel comfortable saying the best outlet of all time. Don't <laughs> tell my employer. I just it said is that. wonderful, and the cohort continues to grow, I swear. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, to, to put a little egg on my face recently i was tweeting about how uh there's no game good games criticism and uh everyone is incredibly hostile to it and all of this like doomer shit and uh david of unwinnable was like just so you know we are still publishing unwinnable and i was like god damn it that's right there's still at least one place publishing really really good games crit uh over and over uh so yeah anyway we support unwinnable here and um uh, look uh, Philip, we're going to talk about all sorts of things, but one of the particular reasons that we've uh, called you here today um, is because you have a, a, a truly outstanding article in Unwinnable. Which mm -hmm. which issue is this? It's it's from September of 2020 um, that you wrote called Watching Myself Die um, on Blackness in The Last of Us, which we have already referenced uh, thus far in the podcast, but we are uh, excited to get into it more well thank you um i sounds like i guess i don't know if the first last of us episode has come out yet otherwise i'll definitely have to have to check that out so we're we're recording in advance so you you have done all possible homework we haven't actually uh released <laughs> <laughs> released any of these yet um but i guess you you talk about it a little in the article but can you tell us about like i don't know in general your last of us experience and and Last of Us Part Two experience, like upon release. Yeah, um, you know, so the the early portions of the article kind of get into that. Uh, you know, the, the, my relationship to the Last of Us franchise started way back when it was first released on the PS3. I was, you know, like many people, really into Naughty Dog games. The Uncharted games were were a fun time. Uh, so, like when the Last of Us came out, I played that. Uh, upon release, loved it. Like it's one of those games where I think at the time and when when, when did that come out? Like 2013 or something like that. Um, yep. Mm -hmm. You know, I had just uh, I guess I would have been early in in undergrad, and I still wasn't that um, invested on the games criticism side of things. But my background is in creative writing, and you know, since then I went on to do like graduate programs. So like, um my initial reaction to the last of us was just hype like loved it played through it multiple times like on every difficulty etc uh and then you know obviously it was released again um with the remastered version and i think that's when i started to kind of notice more some of the missteps that the game has around blackness and how it's kind of utilizing mm. black characters in order to you know progress the storylines of Joel and Ellie uh, throughout the first game. And, you know, we see that in different ways uh, in the second game. So, um, 
you know, by that point in time, I was kind of a little bit more skeptical of of uh, Neil Druckmann and what they were going to be doing with the franchise with part two. But um, I mean, it would be a lie to say that I wasn't interested in like what was going to happen next. Um, the long and short of it is, uh, you know, The Last of Us 2 came out, I think, probably during the worst time possible for thinking about about it in the context of how it thinks about race or doesn't think about race, given the fact that George Floyd was murdered uh, less than a month from it coming out. Uh, so I think going into the game, yeah. I definitely was thinking about all those things. Um, and unfortunately, at least in my opinion, it, it, it doesn't really do a good job of remedying maybe some of the critiques that myself and a lot of people had with the first game. It's interesting that uh, that you mentioned kind of being you know i think all all of us on this podcast were very excited about it uh when we came when it came out and we talked about in an earlier episode um uh with nicole carpenter actually how like there there were some criticisms of it that were present almost immediately you know the kind of the aspect of like uh fridging joel's daughter you know the kind of the themes of 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 like the dad game and patriarchy and these things that you can kind of go back and forth on are like, is the game doing commentary on it? Is the game just uh, copying these tropes outright? Um, but it felt like, at least to me, that this aspect of like looking at the racial politics of The Last of Us was something that was almost not even brought up for like five, six years after it came out, at least not in like uh, any any kind of mainstream sense. Had you, like, did did you feel like the the thought occurred to you spontaneously, or had you, like, heard other people talking about it at the same time that you were thinking about these sorts of things? Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't know where the genesis is uh, for specifically my connection to that in The Last of Us. Um, I'm sure that probably some of it is, like, you know, at the time, my uh, thesis advisor was a black woman who was very interested in, you know, racial justice and activism. So I was starting to think about those things outside of games. Um, and I, I was thinking about those things in terms of my own like creative writing projects. But I think the irony is that um, it wasn't until, you know, much later um, when I was thinking more seriously about like, oh, I could be a writer or something that um I connected that, oh, games can also be this medium where we can have these critical engagements mm -hmm. and un un unpack, you know, race in, in this instance or other topics around uh, socioeconomics and et cetera. So um, I, I want to say that it probably had a little bit to do with just the context of the time. Um, but I, I, I definitely can say that uh, kind of my awakening into conversations around games regardless of race or other ideas started with like waypoint and austin walker and kind of the work that he was doing way back in like 2016 so uh i'd probably pinpoint it there i think i think a lot of us have have austin walker as kind of like it's like if not the origin point at least like a very important aspect of our growing games consciousness 100 yeah, yeah was it his paste review of the division or battlefield hardline that's like the one i remember so specifically it's like that was the moment yes i i honestly can say yeah it was probably battlefield hardline like just ideas around policing and things yeah. like that um kind of taking our real world uh issues and kind of unpacking those through how we're recreating those in games definitely was something that i'd never seen before and it inspired me to try that mm -hmm. in, in future stuff um, well, I, so I want to get, I want to talk about like more of the specific content of your essay, um, when we get to it, but as, as we like to do, I think we should just talk about like what went on in this section, because like, boy, there's a lot of stuff that happens on day two and three of, uh, the last of us part two, uh, Blake, here's my take and tell me, uh, tell me if you agree or not is like, I think these sections are very good generally as kind of like in a game sense i think that as soon as dina is not with you it is the point where the <laughs> game gets like not fun you know in kind of like a yeah a, an yeah. intentional tonal sense here's the thing we can all say dina the best character of the game at least until we meet some characters next episode um yeah it's 
she, well, she, uh, so it's weird, right? There's there's a bit if I can uh, summon an old Last of Us term. There's some ludo narrative dissonance in that Dina is kind of this like comic relief to just like the horrific shit Ellie is doing without really thinking about. It. Like you like curb stomp some dude and then <laughs> Dina's got a quip. She's kind of Nathan Drake in that way. And when you remove that, you are just left with Ellie, who, like, famously in this game is just, like, a, a monster. And I think, like, it'll be interesting, s- sorry to, like, couch this in next episode so much, but I think it's it'll be interesting to revisit that idea next episode when I think this game uh, changes tone a lot. And certainly doesn't become a fun game or a lighthearted game but definitely becomes more palatable. But yeah, like getting through some of these Ellie sections are just like, I don't know the right word, dour, the, 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 the toxic, venomous. Like it is just brutal throughout. Yeah, I mean, you know, this has been, um, so my, my partner Annie has been watching me play basically the whole thing. And like in the first up through the end of day one, there is kind of like, even in the combat sections, there's like story happening all the time you know it's like they're pretty much always chatting and and i guess because this is the first day where you're really fighting humans like almost exclusively uh, day two at least is divided into like two parts and the first part up until you finally meet jesse again is like unbroken combat with like almost nothing else which is both really impressive from a design sense and just fucking Mm -hmm. like I remember the first time I played this, I was like, I cannot believe they are throwing this much at me. And uh, and I felt that way again this time. Like, I think it feels very intentionally overwhelming in just, like, how big the combat areas get right away. Yeah, there's, there's like, that extended sequence in day two where you're going through, like, uh, little pockets of towns and suburbs. And there's the, the one right before you hit Jesse that must take, I don't know, depending on your skill... 20 to 30 minutes to just play through this one huge arena that I think is like every time I go through it, even though I know the house is pretty well at this point and know like the routes I should take, it's exhausting in a way that I think is good. Like, I don't mean that as a negative, but just like getting to the point where you fall into the basement and have to escape through the dudes bum rushing you and everything and everything that precedes that. Like, it is an exhausting sequence of events that uh, I think is cool. Like, I think the gameplay of this game. Like, we, we've talked about it a bit. I think it goes fucking hard. <laughs> like, I think this game is so fucking fun. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, Phil, to be incredibly reductive about it, like, how do, how do you feel about, like, fighting people in this game? <laughs> no, I mean, that is, I, I would say, like, that's kind of the thing, you know, returning to some of the, the clips of the game, something that I'm thinking about is mm-hmm. uh, specifically that section I think you all are referencing, if I'm remembering correctly, where you're in kind of the neighborhood and you you get like this extended kind of running through a bunch of different buildings sequence. And I remember when I first played through the game, just like being blown away at how fun it is. Like it is, unfortunately, it is very fun to kill people in The Last of Us 2. <laughs> um, and, and that seems to be kind of like one of the big, I mean, maybe issue isn't the right words, but like it's a friction point with kind of the narrative that they're going for when I I just love, like I'd play through the game just for the combat. It is, it's a weird thing because I think we talked about a little when, when the game came out, it seemed like a lot of the takes were like the last of us is a game that wants to make you feel bad for killing people. And like, there are a lot of efforts the game puts towards that end. The, the enemies have names. They scream really loud Mm -hmm. when you shoot them. This is the first section where you're like killing dogs, which is not a thing that I think any of us probably find pleasant. Um, and yet in that kind of game makes sense. It's like their AI is so interesting and the tools that you have available to you are so versatile that like it's fun you know it is fun to set up a bomb and watch someone walk into it even though that person reacts in like an accurately horrible way so two things i want to bring up one i think there's a specific moment in when you get jesse or my game was bugged a little bit where they start introducing screaming enemies more often. Because I was in one combat encounter where four in a row screamed all in the same brutal way. And I was like, are they ramping up how brutal they want me to think these kills are in subtle ways? Uh, But anyway, back to the point at hand. Uh, We've talked about this a few times on this podcast. I think in regards to The Last of Us Part 2, 
and we talked about this years ago i mean um and the god of war uh reboots is like the idea of games that are meditations on violence being too fun for that message to always feel um good or like actually like uh for it to have any impact and i don't know what the solution there is because we've played manhunt which i think has a lot to say about violence and is not particularly a fun game half the time and i don't know if i prefer that and it's like i don't know what this game should do if it's if it's a game about media violence which i think it is to some degree it's like should it be a less fun game i don't know do i think that message is lost in how much i just want to replay combat encounters Maybe. I still have yet to, like, navigate the solution. Have you all thought about this at all with this game? Yeah, I mean, I also don't really know what what a potential solution... I don't, I don't think there is, like, a clean mm-hmm. solution for, for games in this regard if the, if the main verb is kind of combat in, in the sense that The Last of Us presents yeah. it. But I think something... And I'd be curious if you all talked about it in the, in the previous episode that I've been thinking about that I really love is, like, a really... Just it's like a moment in time uh, in The Last of Us Part Two, when you first get to uh, was it Jackson is the name of the settlement, um, mm-hmm. and you just have that little snowball fight. It's still it's basically just a third person shooter moment, but it kind of changes. Yeah, it's like here's aesthetic. how you use the controls. Yeah, uh, and I feel like uh, things like that is kind of like I wish that the game maybe had a bit more imagination or or explored that possibility space a little bit more to maybe balance out the just the immense you know grotesque violence that it also presents but i don't know it's interesting because that kind of stuff is is also in in left behind the dlc for the first game there's a lot of the game kind of like uh, breaking or making fun of itself or whatever where if like oh you have like a, a shootout but it's a water gun fight or like oh you like throw bricks mm-hmm. at a car instead of throwing bricks at a clicker and it is this kind of like using the same verbs in a in a non-violent sense which is interesting uh, Blake can I ask you what because I, I you know it, it's very obvious to me that this game is about violence in some way what is the like media connection that you're seeing here you you said that this is kind of a game about like media violence oh i i think i meant more video game violence specifically rather than media broadly but i think like similar to games like god of war it's asking the questions about like why are we enjoying this why do we want to you know keep killing it's trying to push the player and and maybe this is makes it being fun actually more impactful i think in some ways this game wants to push the player to commit these horrible crimes all this then to pull the rug out from underneath it and be like hey wait isn't this actually fucked up don't you disagree with ellie isn't she a monster who's the fucking enemy here blah 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 blah. all these things people have talked about that i think is one of the messages of this game Where, where i'll push back and maybe we can talk about it later is i don't like the idea that's the only message of this game but that is, I think, one of the big points of the violence and some of the conversations it's trying to have that I don't necessarily think it does super well, to be honest. Jacob, finally, this podcast is improving my miserable life. Oh, you're finding value in the work? You like these games that we've been playing? No, of course not. We play terrible games. I just actually got to try the sponsorship we've been talking about. I got a Henson Razor. Oh, yes, sir. Last razor you'll ever need. Truly, it is amazing. I like it so much, I've just started shaving all over my body. My arms, my eyebrows, my legs, everything. I am smooth as a baby's bum, baby boy. And dear listener, you too can experience this bliss if you just go to HensonShaving.com and use the promo code ROTTEN. You're going to use this razor to shave your head like Max Payne now? All I'm saying is if Max Payne had a Henson razor, he would not have looked so damn patchy. That's HensonShaving.com, promo code ROTTEN. Boy, we all know December is the best month to give gifts. All right, Hotshot, what you get me then? Uh, the, the warm glow of friendship uh you made me play anatomy there's no glow left Th- this is a dying star whatever this is it it's done jacob okay how about a lifetime nebula membership wait really a lifetime that's like 45 years at the, the clip at the clip i'm going <laughs> <laughs> Nebula has brought back lifetime memberships for the month of December, and now you can also give them to other people. Uh, the link is is slightly different for this. It's in the show's description. But uh, imagine, imagine it's the day before Christmas or the day before Hanukkah. 
I don't know when Hanukkah is. What? You don't have a gift. I, Hanukkah is a different date every year, Blake. Imagine that you you scramble, but then you buy your loved one a Lifetime Nebula membership. Imagine the smile on their face when you tell them they can listen to every episode of Something Rotten early with tons of bonus episodes and no ads for, for their whole life. Now it just feels like you're being sarcastic. Blake, imagine the affection you'll be showered with when you tell them that they can watch exclusive videos from their favorite Nebula creators like me, Leo Vader, Patrick Willems, Philosophy. Philosophy tube and more. You including yourself in that list? Yep. You don't know who I hang out with. <laughs> I'm just gonna buy a Nebula subscription for myself. I don't feel like you're being serious with me right now, Jacob Clinton. You can do that too. It's, it's two fifty for a month, or you could treat yourself to a lifetime subscription. Okay. What do you What are you actually getting me? A smile. Something that I noticed uh, this playthrough that's actually it's similar to you mentioning, you know, noticing enemies screaming more is particularly on day three ellie gets mm -hmm. a lot more vocally aggressive did you did you oh, notice this where it's like when you are in some of those big combat arenas like around when she's getting the boat or whatever in in seattle yeah. um there she she does a lot more of like yeah come on motherfuckers it's like that's like something that she'll say sure which is this this interesting thing because it's like sometimes uh it is fun to have a game character mm -hmm. say things and like in on the in the uncharted games if you like blow up three people with a grenade and then drake says something that references you blowing up three people with a grenade you feel great but it's like yeah. it is i do think it's it's kind of trying to highlight this weird uh, maybe separation between the player and ellie where like she's saying that and I'm, like, hearing the person screaming that I just shot, and it feels, like, she feels yeah. kind of psycho, you know? It's, like, it is that, like, if a real person was reacting the way video game characters reacted to killing people, then they would seem like they completely lost it. And it's, like, when Ellie starts acting more like a video game character, it really seems like she has lost touch with reality because, like, the the people that she's killing are kind of painted with such a realistic brush and there are two moments as well i think that are kind of the i don't know maybe the period at the end of the sentence here that they're trying to trying to say with the story it's like where you see ellie after everything at the end of the day you see the one where uh, after the nora sequence where um dina she takes her shirt off and dina kind of dresses her wounds and helps her stitches and then the next one the the, the last one in day three i actually think is a pretty well done sequence where ellie is laying in bed watching dina sleep after you know just like everything is kind of crumbled around her she is realizing she has to abandon her revenge plan and go back to jackson because of dina's pregnancy complications that i think is where the game is trying to deliver its you know um violence message of like clearly this is impacting her yeah you're playing it and ellie is remarking in the moment but when she is removed from that violence she is she's bloodthirsty obviously but she is not bragging about it in the way we'll later see the wlf talk to each other and be like i fucking blew that dude up and it ruled it's like ellie once she is taken away from her actions is like kind of in agony based on like what she is doing and i think like i think that section with dina um where she dina's asleep is actually really well done and really heartbreaking um Phil philip let me ask you uh one of one of the big themes of kind of how people interact with these games is like their connection to the characters and how how far that connection will take you you know because in in the first game obviously we were paired with joel the whole time at the end joel makes this kind of uh yeah a controversial decision that i uh personally feel like is supposed to remove you from his perspective you know or whatever um but there are some people who i think feel so connected to joel understand his decision whatever that they're kind of still with him the whole time similarly this game does really feel like it wants to first connect you to ellie and then push that basically as far as it will go and be like are, are you still with her you know like even now we know you care about ellie are you going to like back up her decisions if you can kind of recall the first time that you were playing this were you were you like initially on her side and then uh changed your mind or were you with her the whole way or like you know <laughs> what what were your feelings about ellie um 
Yeah, I mean, I I definitely think that just broadly speaking, I actually loved the decision to, you know, kill off Joel and, you know, it it felt like a natural Mm -hmm. progression to really place us into Ellie because she was always the more interesting character. Um, And I, I think in that sense, it was really kind of joyful to be able to kind of really explore what her character could be like, especially I think how you all noted with with Dina. I mean, Dina brings out this other side of Ellie that uh, we don't get to see for the other portions of the game. Um, I don't think I ever really felt that bought into her revenge quest. Like it always kind of, if anything, I kind of feel like the the overall narrative with the um, I don't I don't know what you'd call the shape of it. It's almost like a uh, like a like water spinning down a drain, you know, in the sense you with the, with this narrative, mm-hmm. um, I never really liked that. I think it kind of reminded me a bit of like uh, Christopher Christopher Nolan, in my opinion, kind of falls into as he gets really interested in the mechanical ideas around how the narrative is going to work, which then can sometimes do a disservice to the characters. Um, I think the same is kind of true with where the narrative goes with the revenge storyline, and if I could just digress for a second to something that that Blake said yeah. earlier about these two moments um where we after Ellie has kind of done this these incredibly traumatic violent acts you get these these other required moments of her kind of dealing with some of the trauma that exists from from doing those things and just a thought that has come to me as we're talking uh and going back to that idea of what could maybe be different um to zhuzh out some of these other ideas that it's working with in in relation to violence um and those two moments that blake you're pointing out i kind of feel like it takes the agency away from the player and kind of um tells us how we're supposed to feel about ellie in these moments and what if there were some verbs that were available that kind of placed us in ellie's body in those moments and got to actually experience um interactively you know how she's grappling with some of that trauma maybe that would kind of you know, go against some of the friction that exists with the narrative versus the actual gameplay. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I think this is a game that it just by design is like trying to tell you what you're supposed to think rather than letting the player figure it out. And like, I don't necessarily agree with some criticisms that this game needed more choice to it, you know, because it's like movies or books don't have to. And I don't yeah, think yeah. that's what you're saying here. But it's like, I do think in a lot of ways, it re- it removes the interactivity so it's like okay now it's neil neil and Haley's time to tell you what the player you're supposed to be thinking it's a lot of telling instead of showing in those moments i guess not literally <laughs> because it's a cut scene and it's showing but you know what i mean yeah, it's it's an interesting question you know because i think that um i i do think that one of the one of the challenging things but one of the strengths of this game is generally just making you stay with characters who would not do the things that you would do you know like i think i think that's important to the unpleasantness of this game you know which i think is an intentional choice is to like force you to to be in the heads of these people and so yeah i you know certainly uh, as we'll talk about in the next section, a lot of the game's effort is to get you to empathize with someone who you thought you would never, you know, start a character off by doing kind of the most hateable thing in the world and then ask you to care about them, which is yep. a, an interesting story thing. But it is, yeah, it's it's a fascinating idea to think about, like, what more could the game have done with Ellie, who I think, I mean, me at at the end of day three absolutely if not two i am feeling like really kind of out on her quest and i think i think you're kind of supposed to you know like i i do think that you are supposed to feel like a detachment from her something i was running up against playing it this time and and i really don't remember how i felt about the game originally in the moment um when it came out I, I'm a simple gamer. I'm sure when I played it the first time, I was just like, hell yeah, I'm out for blood. And I was all about it. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> um, I'd like to think I had a better take in the moment, but probably not. But playing it this time when I know the story beats, etc. cetera, I, I've been trying to figure out if I think the way I find Ellie's sections narratively um, unsatisfying are intentional. I I don't necessarily think this is a poorly written game, so I don't think it's like a failure of the writing that I'm playing through it being like, I'm unsatisfied by this narrative. Rather, 
I do kind of, I've started to think now that I've played a little further past the Switch, where I'm like, oh, here's here's some shit I'm really into. I do think there is an intentionality to playing through Ellie's sections and kind of feeling hollow during it, which I think is kind of interesting. Well, Blake, do you want to talk about a little, I, this was your kind of broad take close to when the game came out, but we haven't talked about it much here. Um, you, you analogized this game to addiction, like pretty persuasively, which I assume is more about the Ellie character and, and plot line. Oh yeah, absolutely. Do you, is this, is this a good time to talk about it or should we wait till like more stuff has happened in the story? I mean, you know, like I, I think it, it's relevant throughout, especially by day two. I think the point when it's most uh, profound is probably at the end of mm -hmm. the game where you can liken her actions to a relapse. Um, I did, I did write a piece for unwinnable uh, about this, but um, yeah, Ellie, I, and I, I have no insight into whether or not this was an intentional thing or just like my curse is to view media through the lens of addiction because I am in recovery. Um, but I think you can easily see Ellie's quest for revenge and a lot of revenge media, to be honest, as allegories for addiction. You know, Ellie is in, in those moments we've talked about clearly not vibing with herself she is like fuck i'm doing some awful shit and in the moment you can kind of see her wrestling with this is going to have repercussions on my mental health um and then she gets up on day three and she goes right the fuck back out and that is no different than me blacking out waking up being like well th another worst day of my life time to do that shit again <laughs> you know like it is a it, it just directly relates itself um and i think the moment i've talked about several times where she lays in bed and looks at dina i think is like really heartbreaking for me because i see it as a moment where it's like the only thing she has left anchoring anchoring her to a normal life is this person and i think a lot of addicts you know uh, loss is definitely a big part of addiction as people rightfully so in my case will exit your life being like i can't fucking deal with this that sometimes like one significant other or a parent or friend becomes this like anchor of normalcy and like you are so scared of losing that through your own actions or outside forces that i think in that moment it's like it's a really beautiful sad and scary moment where ellie is grappling with like her own actions and the idea of whether or not Dina is going to survive her pregnancy or just the world she lives in and kind of being left by herself, which I think in a lot of addicts case, myself included, being alone was the scariest thing in the world because you have to think about everything going on. And I think I think like whether or not this game was written with that in mind, I really have no clue. Never talked to or met Neil Druckmann to ask him. But I think this game viewed through that lens, like I think it does a really good job of handling addiction. And like what it has to say, it is not, um, it's not like a, you know, some games tackle mental health in, uh, more cozy ways. I often think of Celeste, you're climbing the mountain and it's all kind of very on the nose. This game is more like a pun intended brick in the face with its addiction metaphors. And the way I appreciate, like I went through it, I know what it's like. It, I don't really need to be coddled into it, you know? So like I do kind of like respect this game being like shit sucks huh you should probably stop <laughs> and it's like yeah probably i should probably fucking stop um so yeah I, i'd like to revisit that when we get to um the last episode because i think there is a really 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 tough moment in there in terms of addiction but yeah that's that's more or less it it's i've i've always i mean i've always appreciated that reading as someone who it would not have occurred to me but i i think viewing yeah. viewing ellie's actions through that lens um, I, it makes it more comprehensible to me, you know, because there is, there is so yeah. much that she's doing. And I guess the last thing I, I want to, I want to stop talking about Ellie for a moment and, and talk about, uh, Philip's article and kind of the other, the other things going on here. But the mm -hmm. last thing that I want to say is, um, you know, I think some of the most compelling parts of this section are these two Ellie flashbacks that you play through where the first yeah. one is her kind of um struggling to uh to to like connect with joel it's this thing where she's kind of on a hunting trip with tommy and then her and joel go to a hotel and they you know fight some people and it's basically like things are testy between them but they care about each other um and then the next one is 
Ellie goes to the hospital uh, where the last game ended and uh, and finally demands of Joel, like, tell me what happened or I will you will never see me again. Um, and and Joel tells her and, uh, you know, in in an unbelievable moment of acting, you know, from um, from Ashley Johnson you know, essentially, like, has a panic attack on the spot with, like, the horror Mm. of realizing not just what Joel did, but, like, what her life meant and what her life means now, which I I think is one of the most agonizing moments of the game. Um, And it is followed by more of the most agonizing moments of the game because there's a moment in this section where Ellie realizes who the people she's fighting are and why they want wanted to kill Joel in the first place and essentially and I mean tell me if you disagree with this reading but like realizes that she probably agrees with them and yet she yep. keeps killing them you know like that is that is kind yep. of the the like the cognitive dissonance of what we know that she feels which is she would have preferred to die she would have she didn't want Joel to, like, kill the doctors and the fireflies and whatever, mm-hmm. versus her actions, which are killing the sons and daughters of the fireflies who are trying to take revenge on Joel, is, like, you can just feel it, like, breaking her brain. You know, that she is just kind of, like, not equipped to handle that conflict, which I think is, you know, the most interesting part of the Ellie story, is her just, like, fundamentally not being able to square these two things yeah. in her head i um yeah that that moment at the hospital i i don't i don't super agree that i think it was a big revelation for her because i think one of the smart things about the game's writing is she always knew yeah. it was a lie and rather the reveal is that joel finally told the truth and that's what crushes her but i do agree i think that's an amazing moment i remember the first time i played this game that scene like got genuine like emotion out of me i think i like literally cried um but yeah i mean like philip i'll be curious to hear your thoughts on this but just jacob based off what you said it's like yo i should stop drinking but i can't (laughs) you know what i'm saying like that's kind of what ellie's going through in that moment i know the solution i i know the cause of was the homer simpson line i know the cause of and solution to all (laughs) of my problems and i'm going to ignore them yeah i mean i i think it's before we get into my article and all that, yeah, I think it's to preface, like, I think there's this game does so many things well, like, especially narratively, like, I, I really, really mm-hmm. love what it's saying about grief and uh, reconciliation. Um, you know, I, I don't think that this scene happens in the section we're talking about. So maybe we don't need to get into it too much. But um, I just I love the moment It still sticks, sticks to me to this day of uh when Joel and Ellie are on the the patio and he he basically is asking for forgiveness yeah, and she that's... says like well I want to I mean not that I can right now and that I think that for me that speaks so much to kind of what you're getting at Blake with addiction because you know I've had those kinds of conversations with people in my mm. life and um I think it's in those moments that uh you know the humanity on display in this game is is really there and I think like Ellie actually is like a really phenomenally well-written character um, for all the reasons that y'all mm-hmm. are pointing out. So, um, And I think, I think this is a good pivot point because we, we have spent so much time talking about uh, how the deaths of the people that she's killed affect Ellie. You know, like that is, that is something that clearly had a lot of thought put into in this game of like when Ellie kills people, how does she feel about killing people? Um, and then you have this other side of it, which is, what's going on with the people she's killed? Are they afforded uh, internal lives? Are they afforded any characterization whatsoever? Um, and and how, especially uh, from a racial lens, like, what? how are those deaths treated in the narrative? So, mm. uh, Phil, before we start talking about this, do you want to give us just, like, the elevator pitch of your article again very very reductive but with with the kind of understanding (laughs) that we're gonna talk about this more yeah yeah yeah. um you know when i was playing through the last of us 2 i was really thinking about you know how it's conceptualizing its characters especially you know the people of color that exist in the game because 
as we saw in The Last of Us Part One, you know, you have characters like Sam and Henry who and, and Marlene, who are kind of these characters who I think on the surface are well written. Like the the scenes that they're in are good. It's not like like they're bad or anything like that but they kind of exist as like these mechanical functions in order to propel joel and ellie to the destination of the hospital at the end of the game and um with that in mind i was kind of thinking like okay like i'm sure people i i think people had talked about it by the time last of us 2 was in development so i was like okay how are they going to kind of remedy some some of these things um with the second part and uh you know I think that the game does a better job with um like its Asian American characters. Uh but but the black characters in the game still kind of function as these catalysts of um development, um, or these touch these touch points of development and, and Ellie's uh journey uh throughout the game. Um so the 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 essay is kind of looking at kinds of you know, why that's happening kind of my frustration with with that happening given the fact that uh you know it came out during a time where a lot of us were out doing black lives matter protests we were seeing a plethora of police brutality murders of black people in the country um and i think in in a lot of ways i was kind of dealing with my own understanding of blackness and racial awakening um, and how I how I feel connected to my own identity, especially, I think, given the fact I don't get into this in the article, I don't think. But, you know, I grew up in a kind of upper middle class background and in a suburb and I didn't have to deal with race and a lot of uh, aspects of my life, despite the fact that both of my parents who are now in their 70s grew up pre civil rights act. So they grew up, you know, in a, in a world where they couldn't even vote. Uh, to start out and our our yeah. ideas around blackness are very different so as i think in a lot of senses this essay kind of represented a bit of an unpacking of what i was going through at that time in addition to what's going on in the game one of one of the things that you wrote uh that i thought was really interesting was uh you know playing playing the original last of us uh when it came out and and like seeing Sam and Henry and being like, hey, you know, like at least there are black people in this game, <laughs> you know, like that's there. That's something they are uh, nominally well written. You know, they're not kind of embarrassing characters. And then that, uh, you know, the I think the evolution of your thinking and the lack of evolution of Naughty Dog's conceptualization of these characters um is is really interesting you know something we talked about in the first episode is like almost entirely on in text the last of us exists in like a post-racial world mm -hmm. where like if you i think if you read henry sam marlene you know any of them if you just read their character there would be nothing to indicate that they were racialized in any way you know they they would read like white people i think is kind of the the takeaway and i think that leads a lot of people to be like well how could the treatment of these characters be at all racist or problematic there's there's nothing about them that's black you know like they are they are just kind of like straightforward characters and it it requires this kind of more like a wider scale and socially informed look at the game to kind of understand the tropes that the game is using and the the like problems that it runs into yeah i mean i i think of uh you know i had a professor an undergrad who she always had this assignment in her intro to fiction writing class where she'd make everybody in the class write a um, a statement of aesthetics, which was basically, you know, you talking through what your writing is about and kind of how your different positionalities affect the things that you're writing. And something that would always happen in her workshops was that all the white students, especially the white male students, would say, well, like race doesn't mean, doesn't isn't in my writing and it doesn't matter to for the things that I write and kind of thinking yeah. about, um, well, if that's the case, how does whiteness play into how you formulate your idea of self in the world and how you interact with other people? And I think in the same token, um, you know, I, I think the, the, the last of us, as you said, it's kind of devoid of race. It's not necessarily like clearly it's thinking about it. Like it, it does a good job, uh, especially in, in the part two of having like a pretty wide range of different looking people but it, it, i don't think it, it's really 
you know, they don't think they really spent the time and kind of maybe building out, you, you know, whether it's literally on the page in the main narrative or just during the world building phase, like how is race actually playing out in, in these settlements? How are we understanding, yeah. um, you know, how people would interact in this post-apocalyptic mm-hmm. world? Um, have you, um, I, I referenced in an earlier episode, have you run across any of um, Cameron Kunzelman's writing on this topic i don't think so he has a chapter on it in his his book the world is born from zero that i'm i'm holding up right now um but one of the things that he wrote that i thought was like a a really interesting kind of um it it it, i think your and his pieces complement each other is um he he's writing about the subject and he says like you know a lot of people die in the last of us but i kind of i what i can't believe is that they all die equally (laughs) and one of the things that he points out is that essentially all all of the black characters have more or less the same death which is that they die and the game immediately cuts to black like that is that is just what that's what it happens with sam and henry that's what happens with marlene that's what happens with nora yeah and and it is, and then he contrasts that with how does Joel's death play, which like Joel dies, and then we like get to see kind of Ellie's reaction and how how his death like exists in the world and how it affects her, and he kind of like continues to be a person after he dies and every Mm -hmm. every black character is just like the second they're dead the game just like is like we're done like we're (laughs) over that that part is like through in the game and this this just like repeated cut to black is so striking when you when you start thinking about it i mean you wrote in in your essay like there is not a single black character in these games that doesn't die and like seeing seeing these these patterns of like not only their deaths but like how their deaths are treated is something that as a white guy playing through it for the first time not something that i thought about at all and then as soon as it is pointed out to me i'm like oh my god it's so it is so evident yeah i mean that's that's a really interesting point i'd never had thought about like yeah the cut to black being in each one and and how characters like joel or jesse kind of get to exist um in an in a liminal space after the fact where where we get to see some of uh, ellie and and company's ideas around what that means for them and like you know I, in the article i talk about how uh, a perfect example of this with how blackness is used is that in ellie's room we get to see um is Henry the, the younger black uh, Sam. character? Yeah. Sam. We get to see Sam's um, little action, like a Megazord kind of uh, toy in Ellie's room. And like that was, it's very early on in the game. And that was a moment where I was completely taken out of the game because, you know, we don't get to see what happens after his death in the original version. So it brings up all these questions about like, okay, so, you know, he they killed themselves and then Ellie like scavenged their things and like took something with her and kept it with her her whole life to then put into a shelf. And once, when she's in the settlement Um, and, you know, I think if we were to extrapolate out that idea, you would imagine that, um, you know, if the the ethos of the game is that Ellie kind of knows Joel has lied to her all these years, we finally get this, this moment where, where Joel acknowledges that and fesses up to it. You would think that maybe Ellie would have, also a kind of complicated relationship to the murder of Marlene then, who is this woman that she had a close relationship to for a number of years that Joel murdered in order to, you know, keep up this lie that uh, he presented to her for like a decade or however long it's been. I'm curious, like, what is, I don't know if there's just something historically in media tropes that explains this, but You know, when we think about the way blackness is used in The Last of Us, in a game that seems to be making efforts towards having a diverse cast, the the idea of The Last of Us being a post-racial world is always interesting to me because The Last of Us 2 has bigotry we see it yeah it's like it's like gender discrimination exists lbgtq discrimination exists but like race no yeah (laughs) yeah so so what i'm curious about is just like where does this problem come from that 
you know, I, I don't, Naughty Dog is obviously not without its faults, but like in a game that is making efforts to, you know, have conversations or show diversity in cast, it still falls back on this like tired trope of like black, black people are used in this game to progress plot. They die so that our white characters can go forward. Like where does that problem come from or how do studios with, you'd like to think good intentions make that mistake? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, for one, I think so to, to to preface, especially now that I'm on the game development side of things, like, you know, games are really hard to make. Uh, you know, there's a lot of concessions you have to make in order to make games. And, you know, I could I could sit here all day and be like, I wish they had X, Y and Z and that would have remedied it. But, you know, to, to get the throat clearing out of the way, um, I think that, uh, you know, we when you're dealing with depicting racism or depicting blackness, uh, black racism in this case, especially when you're uh, situating it within America, like a real place, um, you you have to spend like a lot mm. of resources, a lot of time and care and a lot of like, quote unquote, gameplay to really dive into what that means. And I, I haven't played it yet, but, you know, I know the Mafia 3 game does that by really kind of making design mm. mechanics around like how racism would play out and kind of how it's uncomfortable for the player to go about their day. Um, yeah. I think the, I think The Last of Us 2 attempts that in that very brief moment in Jackson when we get the kind of um, homophobic guy who says something, but it, it doesn't really have the the uh, mechanics or the interest maybe to explore that. Um, you know, I, I don't know like where where that comes from other than like it's it's uh, it's really hard to depict and there is not a lot of you know, black people on these teams, if we're, again, just speaking about blackness. But, you know, even even a recent example um, is Final Fantasy 16 and kind of how it, it's formulating its ideas around slavery and kind of how, how slavery would function in a world devoid, seemingly, of racial politics. Uh, um, so, you know, I, I, maybe I'm rambling a bit. I don't know exactly where it would come from. But I think, like again, a lot more yeah. would have to be explored mechanically. Um, that the game's really tight knit narrative maybe doesn't have the the space for, unfortunately. Yeah, you can yeah. you know you can see the kind of you can both see the potential and see the challenge because like I I love the part you know I am a sucker for it like on on the first day where um, Dean and Ellie go in a synagogue and like not only do they talk about. Uh, hey, we're in a synagogue, there are, like, multiple, multiple references to, like, hey, oh my gosh, this is another, like, uh, mass extinction event that, like, Jews are facing, and, like, this is not the first one, there are so many of these in our history, it's contextualizing the outbreak in context of Judaism in a way that I think is is generally really thoughtful and well done and whatever and so it is both uh, very frustrating to see that happen with judaism and not see that happen with like so many other aspects of identity uh, but you do also you know to kind of put on the game designer hat it's like you know you you picture being a naughty dog and being like are they do they just have to walk through like a bunch of different uh, places of cultural significance while characters like explain why this is meaningful? <laughs> you know, it, it, it's I and I I don't say that to like let them off the hook, but I do think the this being such a huge game with so many characters and attempting to tackle so many different things, like they are underserving parts of it, and those parts that are underserved are like only highlighted by the things that they do so well. Yeah, I mean, uh, I don't know if you all are going to have him on the podcast, but, I, you know, I think of uh, Yusef Cole's article, uh, Their World, um, from Bullet Points, and mm -hmm. kind of his whole argument about this homogenous, homogenous vision of what, like, the white frontier could be as a, as a safe space, um, juxtaposed against the urban environments uh, that are solely battlegrounds, uh, in the last I'm, of us yep. i'm smiling uh i'm smiling just because uh immediately before starting this blake asked me do you want to talk about yusuf's piece in this one and i said oh gosh we have a lot to cover in this <laughs> one but like it is you know and i think i think uh his th that piece will specifically also be very relevant towards the end but yeah i think we've talked about like 
even even with just the concept of Jackson being like the the ideal of like the last of us is world being this kind of like manifest destiny town you know of just <laughs> yeah. being like this is yeah. this is what we like just like being out west and like owning a whole bunch of land and just like the the dream being like private property that you can continue to have and, and the false illusion of safety right like people move out there because they think like cities are inherently unsafe so you move out to the middle of nowhere where you're not even near a hospital or a place to buy <laughs> eggs which is like what are you doing um and it's clear in jackson i don't think the game wrestles with this but its security is easily broken like it, it, it all it takes is four people to up in the entire t i guess it's like six or seven people but you know what i mean like and i don't think the game is actually interested in having that conversation or if anyone even thought about that but like Having now played it and read Yusuf's piece again today, I was like, huh, interesting glaring omission there. The game definitely has a very strong, like, urban hell perspective that it's like in, in both games, whenever you get into a city center, it's like, oh, God, shit's bad here. You know, it is like the most intense combat. You're finding kind of the most ferocious human and and uh, infected enemies. It is it very much is kind of begging you to be like, hey, just go back to nature. Like, there's <laughs> nothing of value to be found in the cities here. Yeah, well, it's interesting that, you know, I think we've, we've dealt with, like, uh, conservatives these days think, like, cities are just burned <laughs> to the ground. Yeah. Like, cities are just, like, literal war zones. And it's interesting playing The Last of Us, which kind of has the same... A uh, viewpoint granted through the lens of a zombie. <laughs> I mean, hey, Blake, I, I don't know if you know this, but the creation of the suburbs as a concept was was because of hey, that same perspective. I'm currently reading a book by Jane Jacobs. I'm well <laughs> acutely aware of the history of the suburbs right now. I mean, it makes me think of uh, had, had they never seen um, the original Halloween. Like the the original film has such a great moment where uh, yeah, yeah. You know, Jamie Lee Curtis is trying to ask for help from the next door neighbor and with the lights on and she rings the doorbell and they turn the lights off, you know, like mm -hmm. the idea that the urban environments, urban, you know, especially predominantly uh, communities of color wouldn't, you know, come together in these environments that have robust communities where they're helping out each other as they already yeah. are. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of a bankruptcy of imagination in a lot of senses. But also the game contradicts itself in some ways where you see pockets of Seattle that were, you know, whether it was the Asian American community or like pockets of the LGBTQ communities. It's like it is clearly aware that these pockets existed in the before world and then they just disappear a mere 24 years <laughs> later, which is like not enough time for like culture to reset itself. It's. It's fucking bizarre. I I was I was thinking a lot about uh, how culture exists in this world while playing through it because there's actually there is a, there is a um a part that that Ken referenced uh in our previous episode where they're like they're going through essentially they find like Comic Con and and uh, Ellie and yeah. Jesse are talking about it and jesse's like man we were born in the wrong generation or whatever and it reminded me of um you know the fallout games how like the the worlds of fallout exist where it is theoretically like i don't know a hundred years since the bombs fell or something and you walk through and everything is still just completely like a dirty like the way that the bombs were dirty and all of the culture is just things that existed before the war and it, it feels like everything has just been like at a standstill since the apocalypse and i was thinking about the same thing of the last of us of like don't they have books comics music that was created like since the like ellie has never yeah. known a pre-infected world shouldn't she have cultural touch points that aren't like stuff before everyone died it's just this very like I, you know as, as ken mm -hmm. referenced it's a very nostalgic view of the world and it's like bizarre for me just because it's like what has everyone been doing <laughs> in the like 40 years since well, not even 40 i think it's literally 24 <laughs> years <laughs> like that's all that's happened it's interesting here's a plot point that the game does not need to 
invest too much time into but would have been fascinating to know the theater scene post fallout because it's like okay you can't make movies you can't make tv books would be hard to distribute but you don't have like little traveling theater troops in the last of us world or like local theater communities in jackson or whatever or in the the seattle hawks dome <laughs> the abbey lives in that would have been a cool plot point you could have acted in a play kind of like the witcher 3 actually now that i'm thinking yeah about it. um oh that would that would be <laughs> struggling to memorize lines give us station 11 you know Jacob, there's something I noticed about you. Oh, yeah? You're a very hairy guy. Probably shave pretty frequently, and yet you're not bankrupting yourself on disposable razor cartridges. What gives? Blake, you are so right. If I shaved with one of those new multi-blade things, or even worse, had one of those subscription services, I'd take probably most of my income keeping my beard in check. But, in fact... I shave with a sponsor of this episode, Henson Razors, and they are genuinely very cool. See, Henson sells a classic safety razor that uses standard blades. Standard razor blades, unlike cartridges, are super cheap and not tied to any proprietary system. Even better, though, is that Henson's razor is designed to be super usable for anyone, no experience required. I had no cuts and smooth cheeks, the very first time I shaved with it. It's a classic kind of razor, but engineered with super modern tech. It's the pinnacle of razor evolution, Blake. Hensonshaving.com, promo code ROTTEN. Can I tell you something about me, Jacob? I have not used a razor since I was a teenager. Is that true? I use an electric razor. I'm just really good at using those. Yeah, that's all I use. Blake, here's the thing. I actually use this all of the time. This is a sponsor that I truly believe in. My beard... Uh, it looks full, but it just grows this fast. The thing is, you can get a razor and a free pack of 100 blades, which would last, like, years. You can do that all by going to HensonShaving.com and using the promo code ROTTEN. One one thing I want to ask you about, Phil, because I don't, I don't think we're going to have any other guests who live in Seattle on this show. What's it like playing a game based in the city you live in that uh has been bombed destroyed by zombies and is full of the most dangerous people to ever live you know honestly that that part was really cool like uh i mean i've been in seattle i moved in 2018 yep. i'm originally from michigan and uh you know it, it was like the first time i think i'd played a video game where i was i recognized like a lot of the places that are there to the mm -hmm. point where even like um i, I was playing it and my partner's old apartment building is in the game and you get to like go in it uh, or like you know it, it's like oh, wow. at least it's like in the same location that's like, so the same cool location um, yeah of it and in that sense like that was really interesting like the the sequence in the neighborhood that we talked about way earlier like that was really fun because i kind of had an, an idea of um of what that would have been like and i think they actually did a good job with like the uh the cult uh people i can't think of what their names are right now mm -hmm. um but where they're located in relation to how uh like the earthquake and tsunami stuff would have affected the region as all like you know yeah plausible uh so yeah i thought that that was really cool i i think as as someone who has not spent a lot of time in seattle the uh the thing that happens towards the end of the section which is ellie is taking a boat through a river that has kind of like carved out a section of the city center is kind of one of the most impressive and interesting kind of visual set pieces these games have made of just like seeing you know as as, as a guy who likes to think about big nature stuff you know, the power of water is just this kind of, like, awe-inspiring force, and seeing how they have taken, like, water just, like, carving through buildings, and some of the buildings are, like, half-standing, and, and some are completely falling yeah. down and whatever, is this this incredibly striking image of, uh, you know, the, one of the game's major visual themes, which is, like, nature reclaims uh, whatever, and it is, you know, like, there are more and less interesting ways to do that creatively, and I think this this river is pretty uh, pretty awe inspiring. A small thing I like 
because I'm such a nerd for public transportation, even though I don't use it in <laughs> Minneapolis. But uh, as you can see, the uh, what, uh, but you bike, so you're still good. I do bike. That's true. Um, and you know, I've been to cities where I've had to ride a train before. <laughs> the the light rail train in Minneapolis is just not convenient to where I live. But they're building a line right next to my apartment. <laughs> Sucks. I'm moving next month out of the city. <laughs> anyway, is uh, you the, is they've thought about where to include the um, what is, uh, what is it called? Light rail in uh, Seattle train. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the light rail. The light rail is in certain parts and will like rope around the streets in really interesting ways. I really like seeing that shit. Um, a line that I wrote down from this section, which I, I think is, is something re- relevant to a lot of the things we were talking about, is um, th- they have been busy just killing dozens of people. Um, I think they see, uh, like, Ellie and Jesse see, like, a scar attacked by the WLF. But one of them says, this place, this place makes me miss Jackson. And I was like, motherfucker, you came here and started killing dozens of people. Like, you're removing yourself from the violence of this place? Yeah. Um, okay, I think uh, we, we would be remiss uh, if we did not talk about the first combat encounter with the scars which uh, I will put down as, I think, one of the most impressive combat sections of any video game I've ever played. <laughs> like, it it really, I, I remember the first time I played it, and this time, it did not disappoint. You know, I think a lot of times their technology is used to dubious ends of, like, does it really matter that the game looks like this and sounds like this and whatever? But this first section where you are creeping through tall grass and you are hearing people whistling and you get shot by an arrow and you can't see anyone because the foliage is too thick. I I just, like, it's it's unbelievable. You know, I kind of... It's a part where I, like, lose my critical brain because I'm just so impressed with, like, the stuff the game is doing. One of the best of all time. Yeah. Man clearly hasn't played Kingdom Hearts 2. <laughs> Battle of Hollow Bastion. Kill a thousand like, heartless. Oh my like. god. <laughs> it's, so, yeah, it's so crazy, Jacob. It's really cool. And Goofy was there. <laughs> yeah. No, no, the, the intro to this, uh, this is the scariest scene in the damn game. It always, every time I, I got to it, and I, I got to the moment and I turned my PlayStation off for a day. I was like, I'm not doing this. And I had to like steal myself to do it. But the moment where the first impact hits is so smart because like you're just so used in this game to hearing nature and hearing animals that as you're walking up to the woods you hear whistling and you assume it's birds and then an arrow hits you and you have to learn in the moment mechanically that those are the calls of the the seraphites but you know the called scars as well um and then you have to fight through like what is it a four story parking structure and yeah, then it's such a big area. And then 85 city blocks, <laughs> and then you have to fight a behemoth. It's wild. I died to the behemoth. That was really annoying. Um I I think one of one of the touches that is, you know, like I think I think some of this some of the attempts at humanization of enemies of this game uh fall a little flat for me. But one that I think is just so it's so simple, but it's so like kind of clever is like they have this very sophisticated whistle system you know where there are different whistles that are like i see ellie or like i found a dead body or Mm -hmm. like come over here i need your support or whatever um but when you shoot them they scream in human voices and i i it's one of those just kind of like being taken out of the illusion where you're almost able to picture like i am fighting something non-human you know, mm-hmm. like if I'm I'm in a fantasy game and I'm fighting like wood elves and they only whistle or whatever, but then you kind of see them react to pain in human ways and suddenly the humanness of them is like revealed to you again. And I, it's just like it is. I I think it is really simple but really effective kind of. Uh, humanization of of the uh the people that you're fighting it also feels like up to this point like the culmination of everything you've been learning mechanically through this game because it is like a brutal combat i mean there there are other big combat encounters like the sections in day two that we talked about but none that i feel like make you think as strategically as 
this section does. And especially in the way this game is like, you have to be strategic while also making split second decisions. You can fudge through some combat encounters by just like throwing bricks and hitting people. And it's like the way the scars fight, especially when you're not used to them, is so different than every other infected or uh, WLF human enemy that it's like, it feels like a true test. And one of the harder sections of the game I feel like. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm glad you. <laughs> yeah. I'm glad you brought up the connection uh, to Kingdom Hearts too, because I think that's I think it's hilarious in that um, <laughs> you know one I was a huge Kingdom Hearts person growing up, um, but I think both that Thousand Heartless battle and this battle have something in common, and that both of them both of these sequences were kind of showcased in trailers prior to the release, and then I think in both mm-hmm. instances they like live up to if not surpass kind of what your expectations are, um, but. But that's besides yeah. the point. Something that's interesting, I think, with this section and also the the neighborhood section is uh, I think both of those sequences, like y- y'all are saying, they're just firing full cylinder mechanically and how that connects you to Ellie. And I think it's it's in those moments where you can see the argument for the fidelity and all the kind of visual mastery that's on display because in those moments you really feel like you are Ellie like you feel just as stressed in those moments and yeah I agree the scars fight especially yep. it's like you're not beating that I I completely forgot uh that that was uh or I thought of it while I was playing it then I forgot to bring it up but yeah that the that kind of parking lot fight was one of the early extended gameplay sections that they showed of last of us part two and we talked about in an episode about part one the the e3 demo was so memorable and compelling of the first one where joel is like fighting people through an apartment and you see the enemies kind of begging for mercy and whatever and i i clearly remember in part two it is this kind of horrible detail of violence or whatever but like there's a part in that trailer where Ellie is hiding under a car and you see someone bending down to look under and you can see Ellie like pull the hammer back on her revolver, Mm -hmm. which is this like detail of violence that is most games just don't have the money or interest in kind of to like, like, why would you, why would you, program that such like such a small detail yeah. of like how a gun operates but it it again it kind of it, it is grounding the game in this kind of horrible realism of violence where things are not like guns aren't they are easier to operate in this game than in last of us or in, in real life i mean but like they still are like messy machines they are not like laser beams that you point at enemies and they just die you know there is there is this kind of attention to the mechanics that i i can't help but find compelling we've actually talked about this trailer before on a q a and talking about video game violence and how it's like Mm. uh marketed to the player and kind of the ways the um we we don't need to get into it too much because we've already talked about it but this trailer was like such a uh, specific moment for me in realizing that violence is the point of video games, which it's not, right? In some cases, like The Last of Us is a is a, what am I trying to say? The Last of Us has more to say than you can blow someone's fucking arms and legs off, right? But like it is marketed as and granted it has the wonderful Dina and Ellie moment at the uh the dance, but then that smash cut with violence and what were people cheering for? was the violence was the brutality of it and it's like it i remember that as a a specific moment where i realized like this is what the gamer wants and this is what they're being sold and maybe this is why the outside world thinks video games have a problem with violence hundreds of millions of dollars being spent on how detailed they can make it um uh, speaking of violence look we got to talk about the end of this section which is uh it made annie gasp I will say, uh, where where Ellie goes to the aquarium and finds uh, well, two people who... Before oh, we do that, yeah. do we want to talk about the Nora section at all? Because I feel like that is a big... Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, Philip, I think we kind of talked around it with your article, but I guess we should we should talk about it specifically. Uh, Blake, how about you set us up? Yeah, so um, Ellie is kind of getting nuggets, breadcrumbs, 
about where people might be at one point she serendipitously found polaroids of all the people she was looking for which i think is a funny plot moment um and over a radio that a theater has for some reason that they are able to get intel from the wlf it doesn't matter we can just quickly brush those moments aside uh they're like hey people might the people might be at the hospital go check it out um ellie thinking abby might be there or at least a source of information who can get her to abby heads off to the hospital um you fight your way up to and then throughout the hospital where you confront nora um ellie has a moment well there's a big chase um where ellie immune brings nora down into an infected area yeah i kind of i i don't think we should brush past that actually okay. because i i do think that that is kind of i i mean cameron writes about this in his book and i i kind of agree it's like I think that is maybe quietly one of the most like singularly cruel actions well, yeah, Ellie yeah, yeah. takes. Yeah, is not not even the you know her eventual killing, but like the move to to pull Nora down into a basement that she just knows is like consigning her to a horrible death. Well, it removes any idea of there being a way out of this for Nora, right? Like, there's yeah. no possibility of, like, Nora betraying her friends and Ellie sparing her, or whatever the case may be. It's like, even if Ellie does not, in this case, which she does, beat Nora to death, Nora is going to become infected, That's uh, which is a fate as bad as, if not worse than death, depending on your perspective. So it is a, it is a horrible moment that, uh, you know, Ellie... Uh, we've never seen also, and I think this plays into Ellie's turn as a character... We've never seen Ellie use her immunity as an advantage over others, yes. especially in a way to torture or be cruel. We've seen her, you know, use her immunity to save a character in the case of Dina. But like this is specifically like I'm immune, you're not, and I'm going to use that to hurt you, um, which is uh, toxic. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe that's not the right word. It is a uh, it's cruel. It's very hard to think about. Um, and so the chase, of course, ends with um nora just gasping for breath the the spores of the virus are you know quickly doing a number on her lungs and ellie interrogates her um and nora she's at, ellie's asking about joel kind of like trying to understand why this happened where's abby why did you do what you do nora um and what i kind of think is a badass moment called <laughs> joel little bitch and i'm like that's kind of a, that's kind of a badass <laughs> thing to say um and, you know, shows little to no remorse, is not going to give up her friends. And also reveals that she is a firefly, or was oh, yeah, a firefly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, this is, this is, I think, an important bit of the moment is, mm. like, I think this is where Ellie puts it all together. Yeah. Like, why they wanted to kill right. Joel in the first place. And um, then the player is given back some amount of agency and that you are pressing quick time event button prompts to control a cutscene. As we are just close up on Ellie's face as she um, beats Nora to death with, I, I think it's a metal rod. I'm not entirely sure what it is. Um, and we're able to see the anger in there, uh, animated on, in all of Sony's first party <laughs> money ways. And you as the player, uh, it, it, and the way we've talked about this game will take agency away from the player and, you know like make you look at this thing and be like here's how you're supposed to feel this is a moment where it's like you are going to press the button you are going to do it and i don't yeah, i wouldn't call it agency sure. i would call it like forced participation yeah but you know what i mean it's like in ways that they do not do for other of dina's camp um like when uh or, or abby's camp. abby's camp uh when mel and owen are killed you watch that happen you do not press the buttons that cause that to happen in nora's case you press square three times and then it cuts to black. Yeah. I mean, I, I think like, you know, the further away I get out from the sequence, it's a really, um, I like complicated feelings about it. Like, uh, I think in terms of what it's doing for the, for Ellie's character arc, I think it's actually like a pretty effective choice, um, to kind of really force the player into this moment and have to have to sit with the the aftermath with Ellie um that she's going to experience. I think like if anything, it's almost unfortunate 
that they chose Nora as the character that has to experience it. Not to say that like, oh, I should sure. have been a white character or something like that. But I think like the the franchise had already set up, especially I think black players to be untrusting of their ability to, you know, present black characters in uh in a good way or like a a well a, a nuanced fashion that kind mm-hmm. of makes this this moment feel just like another instance of of um carelessness uh which i think can really like sour yep. the whole rest of the game like i i honestly feel like my experience with it once this happened while i did complete the game and there's a plenty of other parts i do like about the game it definitely can can like completely changed my relationship uh to the franchise uh after the fact yeah it's it's and- the moment where the player is like no longer to avoid how the brutality in which ellie is willing to go on this journey and i think like it went viewed through like her character arc it is a good moment like you said but also considering the broader context of the last of us and his treatment of black characters it is just another in what is becoming like a long line of like missteps and fuck-ups from naughty dog i mean and and especially considering as we talked about the kind of like cinematic language in which it's Mm -hmm. treated you know it's like i'm not saying this scene would be better if we saw Nora suffer and die, but the scene plays out in a way where uh, Nora does not matter. You know, it is like what we are looking at is Ellie's angry face getting bloodier. And it's Mm -hmm. like, here is the point of the scene is Ellie's anger and rage and pain being taken out on a person and not the person, you know, that it is, it is entirely kind of like the suffering of the, uh, of the, oppressor Mm -hmm. you know (laughs) like it's it's just look at how bad this is for ellie which is not great for a series that has uh, always kind of put the feelings of its white characters above the the lives of its black ones yeah and i mean it's it's, it kind of sums up you know when it comes to to race in the last of us if you know if i were to put words into the design team's mouth it kind of seems like maybe their thought process is in this post-apocalyptic world, it's kind of like a post-racial thing. Race doesn't matter because we're in this kind of degenerate remainder of society. Like, sure, like let's say that's the story that that they want to tell. It's it's kind of like um, the the avoidance of kind of acknowledging even racism that that used to exist or how those things would you know you know existed in the before times, kind of makes the the whole thing feel a bit off. Like we don't even get a moment where i think blake you were talking earlier like there's not even books like we don't even get a moment where like ellie reads a book that talks about a racist moment and she says damn that's crazy you know or <laughs> you know <laughs> yeah you know? like, <laughs> right, even yeah. If, if we're not gonna you know acknowledge it at least like give us something but uh yeah yeah and and it's also like the the pre-world bigots of the pre-world have, right. have not aged out totally from this world so it's like yeah, Even if Joel was still alive, <laughs> yeah, yeah, Joel yeah. had great politics. Yeah, he's from. Yeah, yeah. Come on now. Um, so it's it's such a yeah. There is so much care, obviously considered for this world and its lore, and then there's so much care not spent on certain parts of it that like highlight where they didn't think through certain parts of this world that they had created that just become a unavoidable the longer you think about them and definitely the more like you play these games and you like actually start to inspect them more so from from one uh horrible death of a wlf member to two more um ellie goes to an aquarium it is one of many museums in this game uh (laughs) this kind of a like a a weird thing that they focus on that I really like, but it's like, man, you got you got a lot of a lot of museums in this game. Oh, hold on, um, really quick. Have you noticed how good some of the framing in some of these scenes are? Not in cutscenes, but like, there's several moments in this game where you are clearly entering a new level, and they have just like framed the oh, it's destination yeah, it's of the level in such a beautiful way, and the way you come out in the middle of this yes. huge thunderstorm, uh, what might be a damn monsoon. <laughs> Um, hitting seattle and you see this ominous aquarium and um ferris wheel which you don't truly know the significance of until later in the game it 
feels like you're in like a horror a tim burton horror movie like it just has a fucking gotham vibe to it that is so good and it's a real place is it that aquarium and the ferris wheel yeah like uh that that aquarium <laughs> that oh. aquarium specifically is where uh completely innocuous tidbit but the oc- the octopus there is the octopus that they based the octopus on and finding dory that like escapes all the time no shit <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> that rules. the point but <laughs> wow that rules That's very funny um yeah so you go it is i mean it is this again it is like uh ellie pushing kind of beyond all reason where it is like she is in this boat she's driving into a hurricane the boat gets overturned she's like fuck it i'll swim which is just this like you know it is choice after choice that she's making that it's just like don't do this just don't I... it's so easy to not do this you know like every every aspect of the environment is saying don't go this way and she keeps pushing forward which it... i think is very important to her character in this game and worth pointing out at this point there's a there's a not too long of a sequence where you play with jesse and yeah jesse like ellie and jesse kind of become aware that it's like hey if we take this route we're not that is not driving a boat through a hurricane we can re- meet up with tommy who is also in seattle trying to hunt down abby um it's unclear if he knows ellie is actually there at that point um and Ellie straight up is like, Tommy can fend for himself, which is one of her heel turns for sure, that she is just like abandoning family and like protecting them or coming to their aid in her own pursuit, which I found pretty yeah. interesting. Um, yeah. And so then uh, you break into the aquarium and uh, you meet two people who are not Abby. Uh, you meet Mel, who you've previously heard is pregnant on in the Abby section, though, of course, Ellie does not know that. Mm-hmm. And you meet Owen, who you don't really know who that is other than a guy who Abby was with. You don't know uh, yet. He's the second best character in the whole game. I, and, well, Ellie does not know that because she kills both of them. Yeah, she never got to learn. Yeah, well, the, I mean, in this moment, I don't, I don't think you're supposed to think much of Owen's death, but yeah. when Ellie learns Mel is pregnant, this has a huge effect on her, which is kind of interesting. I'm not entirely sure whether maybe it's both. She is thinking about Dina's pregnancy. And also, is that the step too far in the Last of Us world is killing a pregnant person? I was never fully sure what that was trying to say in context to Ellie's reaction to it, which is like she... I mean, she has definitely has a panic attack in this one. Like, the, her ears start ringing, or, well, your players, the players do, but, like, she has a full-blown freak out when she realizes that she killed a pregnant person, and I'm like, I've never understood what that was supposed to mean in the broader context of The Last of Us it world. Is, it is a little weird that it's, like, you know, you wonder if, like, uh, if she found out that one of the raiders that she killed had, like, a kid... You yeah. know, would she have the same reaction? Yeah. But it is, I think, I think ge- in general, the game is, is paralleling Mel right. and Dina. You know, right. that she is just having a, a realization that the people she's killing are real. Um, this is a, a very uh, boring observation, but I love Mel's face. I feel like she has a very un-video gamey face, if mm, that yeah. makes sense, where it's just like this, this game, some of the characters, I think, look a little... Uh, just like a video game guy i think like abby's dad basically just looks <laughs> yep. like a character creator guy but like uh, mel is one of those characters <laughs> that it's just like oh i don't think i've played a video game where there's been like a woman that looked like that in a in a way that i find really engaging well that's something nicole talked about right it's like in the last of us one everyone's just hot and in this all game, the women like, have the same face is yeah yeah what yeah, yeah and especially with like mel and also abby like i i don't know that it's necessarily show i guess it's like it's showing different beauty standards or just like different ways women look that aren't laura croft and i think that is yeah. like a commendable part of this game is like abby does not look like your normal protagonist in the same way ellie doesn't either but like abby i think due to her bulkiness which i know was like controversial like is more pronounced as like oh that's not what it's not what women in games usually look like. Yeah, I mean, and even, you know, I, uh, we, we all think uh, Dina is a queen on this podcast. Or I, I don't want to talk to you, uh, for you Phil. Uh, <laughs> no, 100%, 100%. <laughs> you know, it's like, she, hey, she looks, you know, Jewish. Or I yep. think, I think actually the, the, 
facial model person is Italian and we've agreed that we can play each other. But like, <laughs> you know, she's not she, she is not like the Laura Croft type, at least. What was um, the role where you all made that agreement? Uh, what was the role? <laughs> yeah, what was the cinematic role? Was it Killian Murphy and Oppenheimer? <laughs> Mm, no, I've, I've got an issue with that one. He's not Italian. Was, okay, that's fair. Oh, yeah, he's not. He's um, fucking Irish. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> the typical Italian name, Killian Murphy. Yeah, uh, but anyway, this is, I mean, this is a, it's a brutal scene. It really, uh, you know, it is, it is, again, it's like, I think it is maybe Ellie's realization that she's gone too far or something. I mean, because in the, in the next scene, she is mad, but she is kind of ready to go home. Or she's, like, willing to go home, at least. Um, but she doesn't get to, because then some even crazier shit happens. Abby busts in. Jesse catches a stray. He did not deserve what he got. Tommy gets shot in the damn face. And Abby looks at Ellie and says, You killed my friends. I let you live, and you wasted it. Hard, hard line delivery. Very good. And then cuts to black. Listener, check us next episode because I got to eat dinner in 30 minutes. Uh, but yeah, I mean, like, I'll say, and I'm curious to hear y'all's thoughts. Even though I knew what was coming, like, this ending moment before the switch up of the game, I think lands so hard. I think this is a really, really strong moment. Um, and like a rare video game cliffhanger in that, like, like, I can't think of too many games that have cliffhangers in them that aren't just like, play the sequel later. This game makes you really wait a long time to figure out what's going to happen in the rest of the game. It's like, we should say on first playthrough, I assumed this was the end of the game. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. it's like, you think, you think like, okay, here's the climax. And then surprise, surprise, you have 50% of the game to go. Um, But uh, yeah. <laughs> Phil, what do you think of this big scene? I mean, I think it's a culmination of some of what we talked about. I mean, Jesse being being murked in this scene, uh, it doesn't cut to black, right? We get to see Ellie's uh, uh, facial expression and her reaction to the moment. And, um, you know, with uh, with Mel kind of in the, in the moment just prior, uh, I think it's, like a, it's an interesting choice. And it's kind of, but it does fall victim to some of what, the game overall, especially with its black characters, tends to do is like using characters as signifiers. It's like, it almost feels like, you know, you kill a pregnant woman. It's like, okay, any player that might have been confused about is, is Ellie. Ellie right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. At this point, it's like, no, <laughs> you know? Yep. Um, so, you know, it's, it's one of those things where, uh, y- you can see some of the, the, the tension points coming, coming to a head, but that's all to say, yeah, it's a banger, like mm-hmm. switch at this point like absolutely incredible i really i do think and i was i was talking about this with annie just before we started that line by abby like i let you live and you wasted it i think is maybe the most important line of the game or you know in in the top three it is so because like this whole game is just so consumed with like what is a human life worth relative to another what does like justice mean in terms of like killing people or dying or whatever and and so to have just you know like delivered delivered with pain but just also with such like anger of just like what the fuck are you doing you know like yeah. like this was this wasn't supposed to happen like this i think is is what abby is expressing and it is uh it is a tremendously sad line. I, I think it also is the game asking uh, a question in revenge media that I, I find very interesting, and it's who deserves revenge, you know? Yeah. And, like, that is Abby, who obviously... Obviously, these two characters feel justified in their revenge and do not think the other was justified in theirs. And I think this is the moment the game is presenting that question and one it will continue to circle back on through the rest of the game. It's like, which one of these characters deserved to go get the revenge you know and like as a player do you pick sides do you throw your hands up and be like they're both wrong what like whatever the case may be i think that's a really interesting question that this game presents right here and something we're going to talk about in the bonus episode you ever heard of lady vengeance jacob just you wait you gotta watch that shit um yes so we will continue all of these conversations in the next episode boy these episodes are long uh a lot of things happen uh philip 
thank you so much for yep. joining us on uh on this episode of something rotten about the last of us 2 um uh, we we have been informed by your perspective uh, before you were on, but it is it is such a, a a treat and a pleasure to have you here to talk about it in person. If people want to follow you, f- find more of your work, read more of your writing, uh, w- what should they do? Yeah, um, definitely check out my podcast, Origin Story Podcast. Uh, you can find that at originstory.show, or you can. Um, Follow me on Twitter, unfortunately, uh, at 3D Cisco. That's S I S Q O, like the uh, washed up uh, rapper <laughs> from, from the 90s. Um, but yeah, I mean, I really loved talking to y'all. This was, this was really fun. And, you know, I would encourage, um, you know, everybody at Naughty Dog and anybody who's listening to uh, this episode to check out maybe uh, Christina Sharp's uh, theoretical text, uh, in the wake on blackness and being, if you're thinking about kind of alternatives to how maybe media games can, can be thinking about blackness and, uh, thinking about ways that we can imagine otherwise or elsewhere for how we can approach ideas around race and identity, uh, going yeah. forward. I'm checking, I'm checking my podcast app. I'm a subscriber. I got proof. Yo. I got proof. Cause y'all posted <laughs> an episode. Y'all post an episode today that looks awesome. With, today. Uh, Jamel yeah. Brinkley on Bearing Witness and how to write with a good ending. So check that out. There's a there's an check extra plug for that kind of content you're going to hear. Because that shit's so good. And a uh, previous uh, guest of bonus episode, Gareth Damian Martin, yeah. also has yes. an episode. There we go. Um, that's a great show. I like that podcast a lot. Uh, and Thank so you. next week, we will be playing up through Abby's section in the hospital. You can check the episode descriptions for specifics on that uh thank you all for listening for blake hester who has to run to a dinner i'm gonna Uh, drive my name he's gonna drive to a dinner uh my name is jacob geller uh we're gonna let you live don't waste it for now Thank you.